This is Season 7 of the Team Roping Journal's podcast, The Score, the show that started it all in the whole podcasting game in Team Roping and Rodeo. At 3 million downloads and counting, this is where Team Ropers talk, from our weekly short score episodes to the longer sit-down conversations that we get to have that dive deep into the personalities, producers, and horses that inspire the sport. This is where Team Ropers get their must-know information. Hey everyone, it's Chelsea Schaefer. Welcome to another horse market edition of The Score. This is 2024, if you're listening to this in, in the future. We've been doing these every year for the last few few years, and they're a very popular series where we give you a good look at the, the scope of the horse market in the current time and where things are going, where they're headed. I think if you look back and listen back to some of the old episodes... It's interesting to see who called things the way they were, who was worried about the market, who wasn't. Um, But so far, so good on the horse market. Since we've been doing this horse market report, things have stayed strong. And we're excited about the direction the rope horse industry is going, which is why we want to keep you as informed as possible on all of the ins and outs, the who's who, and the forces at work in the market. On this episode, we decided to go big or go home. And that is how we got guest Jeremy Barwick of Western Bloodstock and Triangle Sales on this episode. Jeremy is kind of uh, the king of the horse sale business. Western Bloodstock is the elite of the elite when it comes to horse sales, when it comes to in-person sales. They've got the sale at the NCHA finals, uh, the NRCHA finals. That's just kind of big time what happens over at Western Bloodstock shapes the industry and changes things every year. So now we have Jeremy on today's episode. He is going to give you a big, big overview of of where the market is and how team ropers are affecting things at, at every level and what team ropers are doing right now that's working, that isn't working on the horse buying and selling part of the business. And he's going to tell you, ah, I love this scoop. He tells us what studs are the hottest, the, the ones that you cannot beat when it comes to the sale ring. Um, so very interesting. You're going to learn a lot on this episode. I know I did because I don't often get to talk to people um, in Jeremy's role. So a lot of fun. This is a kind of a must listen to episode. I hope you share it with your friends if they are also interested in buying and selling. Even if you're not at this level, if you want to ever be at this kind of level, this is a must listen. So, uh, oh, and before I go, I will say that Jeremy Barwick is also a partner in the Gold Buckle Futurities that is run by Caleb Drigger, Shane Hanchy, uh, Haven Medjid, Shelby Medjid, Taylor Hanchy. They put on a huge event in December. They've got another big one coming up this spring. Uh, of course, we covered it on the Team Roping Journal's website, and we'll we'll preview it before it kicks off. But there's a lot happening over at Gold Buckle for Charities. There's a lot happening with Western Bloodstock and all the different things that Jeremy has his hands in. And hopefully we cover it all here in this episode. Enjoy. Today's episode is brought to you by Genuine Billy Cook Saddles, the finest handmade saddles and tack at the fairest prices, world famous since 1953. I'll tell you more about their relaunched business model at the commercial break. But until then, you can find out more at GenuineBillyCook.com. First of all, thank you for taking the time. And I, w- I want to go through like your your bio because kind of like Ty Smith, you're a little bit the man behind the curtain that people I, – I always joke that everybody's always talked about you, but I have never met you. And in the team roping side of things, you're kind of – I'm not saying you're new to team roping because you're not, but you're new to being – I'm new to this whole rope horse deal. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, I'm not even going to pretend to lie. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you. So give us your background where you came from the cutting industry, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Get you And you won the world in the NCHA? Uh, yes, ma'am. Three times. Three times. Okay. On what horse? Uh, dual Ray me. Are you a Dual Ray uh, believer? Are you a lover of the dual rays? In the team roping side, it seems like you either love them or you hate them. Is it the same way? Well, he, he, he was actually a dual pep, mm-hmm. but I, I, I am gotcha. actually a fan of dual I am actually a fan of dual ray. Good. Very good. There seems to be quite a few of them coming through at this point. And... They're, they're good horses. You know, you hear some people gripe about them, but at the end of the day, they come back and win. Yeah, for sure. Well, and so how did you end up on the horse sale side of things from the competitor side of things? Uh, you know what? I always liked horse sales, um, and I did buy and sell a lot of horses privately. But 
I, I enjoyed the horse sales. I would go to every sale there is. I'll, I'll go to a Friday night sale just to watch one. I, I enjoy it. Um, so I knew I could not be a horse trainer my entire life and did not want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just approached Ben and Milt about buying Western Woodstock and they were willing to sell. And so we just pursued that path. And, and why Western Bloodstock? You could have bought some other sales or started your own. What about the history of Western Bloodstock? It's the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just the best. It sets, to me, it sets the industry standard. And if I was going to do it, I wanted to have the best. That's awesome. And you have, through Western Bloodstock, you said you're kind of new to this rope horse game. How did you, how have rope horses always sort of been a part of Western Bloodstock? And now how is that changing with what... Yeah, you know, there's there's always been some bought out of there and maybe not intentionally bought to be rope horses, but that's what they ended up being and have gone on and done real well. And but now the last few years especially, you see a lot of those guys coming into the sales and even buying yearlings and two year olds and some older horses too. But it's it's been interesting to watch some of those guys buy yearlings excuse me, yearlings and two year olds to make rope horses out of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like uh, more and more I hear some of the ropers that have bigger breeding programs saying, oh, you know, this one came from Western Bloodstock. I think Ray's a pep came from Western Bloodstock. He wasn't yes, yeah. He wasn't initially sp- – he was. He went to the cow horse first, of course, but um, but pretty quickly he became a rope horse, so. Yeah, and a pretty good one at that. <laughs> decent. He's decent. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty good. Yeah, he's one of my favorites, absolutely. Um, so what have you seen, and I guess, how, what's the trajectory of rope horses been this year in Western Bloodstock? How have things changed, and how has how have rope horses kind of emerged? What's been doing well? Man, I don't know. Um, you know, we've, we've had several come out of the sales that have gone on and done really well. Um, and I think the sires, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different sires that are cutting in cow horse sires that – that now we see a lot of their foals, you know, would he be tough, metallic cat, smooth as cat, hashtags, dual ray, one fine vintage. You know, there's, there's so many of those studs that are represented now in the, in the rope horse world. And, and I think that's cool. And it speaks volumes about what those sires can, can produce horses that can do multiple disciplines. So I think it's just going to continue to grow. Yeah. And what, what has, I guess, overall this year, what has the market done with Western Bloodstock? I mean, I know there's been some records for this year, but what's the bottom and middle done? Has it been as strong? You know, it has. It's stayed pretty strong. I mean, our sales in 23 were up above any other sales we've ever done at Western Bloodstock and Triangle. Um, and it seems like it's it's up from the bottom all the way to the top. I've, I haven't yet seen to see that the the middle end or the low end have have decreased at all yet mm-hmm. um we may see that at some point but i don't think we've really seen it yet everything is either holding steady or or increasing mm-hmm. yeah. and, and i think that has to do with with the horses that we sell they they can do so many disciplines so you've you've got a much larger market to sell to yeah I, that makes sense. That makes sense. And it seems like, yeah, it seems like from the cow horses to the rainers to the cutters, everything, everybody comes to Western Bloodstock because you guys make it. When, when that sale's going on, it's like an event. It's It seems like it's some, it's quite the big deal. Yeah, and, and we do. We we try not to be just a horse sale. We we try to make it an event that, that people want to come to and, and spend a week there in December. Yeah, that's cool. Now, um, give me uh, – what is your – what is your advice to somebody who wants to put one in the Western Bloodstock sale? What does a person need to know when they're going to consign a horse? What's What are the parameters? Well, I think first off, be honest with yourself, mm-hmm. you know, and, and make sure you have a quality product that you're going to bring. Don't think you can just bring it straight out of the pasture to the sale ring and you're going to be successful. You know, there's, there's a process that starts several months before the sale and actually from the time it's born, I mean, nutritionally, make sure you've fed it and raised it properly so that when you go to x-ray, you have the best shot of your x-rays being being good. And then 
you know, and then you go to fit in that horse and those, those yearlings and even I mean, they need to look like show horses. Mm-hmm. They, they can't come in there with long hair and thin and long feet. So just do your homework and, and make sure your horse is prepared for sale day. Mm-hmm. What about for the buyers? What kind of homework do buyers need to do before they, before they walk into a sale? Buyers should always do their homework. They, they should not just walk into a <laughs> sale and say, oh, that's a pretty horse and buy it. Mm-hmm. That's the worst thing you can possibly do. Mm-hmm. You know, go, go look at that horse. And then if you like that horse confirmationally and the way it looks, it's pretty enough, what have you. And then have your vet go check the x-rays, make that horse, make sure that horse's x-rays are sound enough to go do what you want to do. I'm, I'm not one to say a horse has clean x-rays because I don't believe there's a such thing. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as clean. I mean, that's been like saying a dirt road is clean. <laughs> there, there, there's, it's just not, it's not possible. And, and sometimes I think people, and even some vets, to me, are a little overboard on, oh, my God, he's got this. He's never going to make it. Well, I, I find that false. Yeah. Um, and, and I will say, I mean, I, I had a horse that I won 900000 on that failed the pre-purchase. Yeah. And that horse had stifle surgeries three years after he was retired mm-hmm. and would get injected about once a year. So, um I think horses are like people, you mm-hmm. know, some people, some people have a higher pain tolerance than others. And I might have a bum knee and can walk and you never know it. And you may have a bum knee and walk and we all could tell. Yeah. You know, so I, th- I think you have to have a little bit of common sense there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the race horse people are leaps and bounds above us performance horse people when it comes to those kind of things. Oh, really? That's interesting. Because, because nowadays there's there's so many things that can be done to fix a little issue. So if, if you're buying a horse and, oh, maybe it's got a chip somewhere, or maybe it has a little OCD or something, that doesn't mean that horse is not going to be a performer. So you, you need to do your homework and definitely not go off of some x-ray list. Mm-hmm. That's that is the dumbest thing a buyer can do mm-hmm. to be brutally honest mm-hmm. because those x-ray lists and the vets will probably hate me for saying that this, but they're looking at x-rays without ever seeing that horse. And it may have a little something, but confirmationally this horse is perfect. So that little something's probably never going to bother him. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So go look at the horse, maybe have your vet go look at the horse mm-hmm. and, and see, and cause I, I've seen it happen a lot of times. I've seen the x-ray list that mm-hmm. says, Oh, this horse is terrible. And then that same vet that had that list sees that horse in person and looks at him and has a whole different opinion. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably won't like hearing that, but it's the facts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the truth. Yeah, and so buyers should do do their homework on that, and and not just go off of a piece of paper, mm-hmm. and definitely not just walk into a sale and say, "Oh, that's pretty horse, I'm going to buy it," and then yeah. find out there's something wrong with it afterwards. That's that's bad management on their part. Today's episode is brought to you by Genuine Billy Cook Saddles, the finest handmade saddles in tack at the fairest prices. World famous since 1953, Billy Cook Saddles continue to be built in the USA by horsemen for horsemen. In 2020, Genuine Billy Cook was revitalized and has been operating under a new business model aimed at producing the highest quality to ensure maximum performance while keeping true to Western horsemanship traditions. Check out GenuineBillyCook.com for the finest handmade saddles and tack and the fairest prices. That's GenuineBillyCook.com. Now, have you been seeing new buyers come into the market lately at a different lots, rate? Lots of new buyers. The last probably five or six sales we've had, um, just registered bidders and buyers, a huge number of first time people at our sales. Is that the Yellowstone effect? What, what's the, what are you, what are you uh, contributing that to? You know, I, I definitely think in the beginning for sure, mm-hmm. I think it was. And now obviously 
you know, lots of people get in the horse business based off what their friends are doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I think a lot of that's happened. You know, you got a lot of new people in and then their friends saw that they were in. So now they're getting in. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I think it definitely made a huge, huge change or a huge impact the first, the first couple of years. And now I think it's just, it's just friends of friends. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Now, um, what, what are those, are those new buyers changing things as far as, are they looking for something different? Are they giving more money to the trainers to be helpful? What are you, what are you experiencing with the new buyers? No. Um, and that's kind of a hard question because they're probably all really probably, different. Yeah, probably if anything, the new buyers are, are the ones that really need to work on educating themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and some have done a really good job. I will say some have done a really good job and, and really went out there and, and did their homework. And then some have not, mm-hmm. but are quickly learning. You, you yeah. have to. Um, but other than that, I mean, I don't, I mean, other than, I mean, obviously when you get new people and more people, supply and demand. I mean, it, it drives prices up. Mm-hmm. So the more people we have and horse numbers breeding wise have seems to be up, but yet there's still a smaller group that's in town to purchase. So, you know, it's just strictly supply and demand when you don't have as many there for them to buy, the prices go up. Yeah. What now, can you – I should have given Chad a better list of things that I was going to talk to you about to give you, um, to make him do his homework. But do you have off the top of your head, like, if you can say, and maybe you don't want to say, but what was the number one seller this year as far as stallions? Like, which stallions offspring were the hottest this year? Well, I'm going to say that's going to be between Stevie Ray Vaughn and Dora Ish. Gotcha. And, well, and then you got to add a bad bit eyes then. I mean – his first foals were just two-year-olds in 23, and he had the high-selling two-year-old. Um, and Yerlin sold outstanding. So I would I would say those three were probably the three hottest commodities. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then where have mares been for y'all? I know, you know, it's you guys are probably a little bit different than the team ropers who are just kind of starting to be interested in mares. But where have the fillies been for well, you? Well, the brood mares, for years, that was really the – the cheapest market Mm -hmm. you know you could you could buy a pretty nice mare in town pretty affordable but not the last few years you know as obviously as yearling prices go up and two-year-old prices go up then people people started holding on to the mare so we've seen less mares come to town Mm -hmm. so the few so the few that are in town are costing more and uh, and probably a couple things that that just fewer of them with the pick from has made them higher and I mean, there's a ton more stallions than there was 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, there's so many more. So, you know, as, as stud owners, they've got all the mares to promote their studs. Mm-hmm. So they're, so they're having to buy mares. So that's, that's really driven the, the broodmare market up. Okay. Okay. Um, now let's shifting gears a little bit on the horse sale side of things. You also, I mean, you're involved in a ton of different, businesses across the industry but on the team roping side and the calf roping side you have recently gotten involved in gold buckle gold buckle futurities can you talk a little bit about that and how you how you dove in was that a shane hanchy talked you into it or did you were you excited about it from the get-go yeah that was actually kind of shane and haven talked me into that imagine that <laughs> because I'm, I'm not even going to pretend to lie and say i know anything <laughs> about roping because i don't um, I have I have learned a lot, and those guys have taught me a lot the last year, nearly now. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, always watched it as a fan um, and enjoyed that. But was never involved in the rope horse world at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's I tell you, it's it's been a lot of fun. I've met a lot of cool people that didn't know, and Shane and Haven and Caleb they they've all been awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, it was real interesting at the gold buckle for me being from the breeding born and the sales side, just watching what sires and mares those horses were buying out of mm-hmm. was, was pretty impressive. You know, like there were two showing there out of stylish Playlina. Mm-hmm. Well, that's one of the greatest brood mares of all time in the cutting horse world. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, it was pretty interesting to watch those and be successful at that discipline. Mm-hmm. So that was that was pretty cool. 
can you uh i don't know if you've had enough enough experience to judge us over here in real Horse land but where do you think the rope horse business is right now or is going and and what do you think the ropers have to learn before we're at the level of the cutters or the cow horses or the rainers as far as the the buying and selling and the breeding and all that side of the business well i mean what i've what i've seen as far as them buying through the sales i mean they're they're buying plenty of good horses i mean they're they're buying some of the best ones out there mm-hmm. um and it just from the outside watching in the last few years as those rope horse fraternities started and i'll actually say billy myers used to work for me and that's been i don't know five six seven years ago whenever it was and back then he told me then that the rope horse fraternities would change the rope horse industry mm-hmm. and he was right and we were actually talking about that down at the gold buckle when he was down there helping us and and they have i mean what those horses can win and now that they're tracking earnings on them so that's one thing I, I never really understood in the i guess more the rodeo world mm-hmm with with rope horses and rope horses they didn't track earnings mm-hmm. and without tracking earnings it's pretty hard to place a value on a horse absolutely yeah and now that they're doing that i mean the values of these horses are going to get so much more and the amount of money they can win i mean all these fraternities all the different ones i mean riata royal crown gold buckle any of them you the american rope horse fraternity any of them you want to talk about they're all paying so well that those horses are going to get, generate tons of earnings every year. So that, that's going to increase the, the value of it. So, I, I mean, I don't know that I would say I would change anything that they're doing right now. I would, I would say continue growing like they are. That's awesome. I love to hear it. Um, I think I started doing this horse market report series in 2020. And I remember asking people about, you know, the election and, and how they were th- – you know, worried or not worried as far as what it was going to do to the rope horse market. And this question is not meant to be a, a political question necessarily, more just a, a state of a, an economic question. Are you, do you worry in election years or what trends have you seen in election years in the past with the horse sales? And, and what do you think, you know, we should expect with this election year? You know, honestly, I think since COVID and all that crap, I think people just give up on politics totally Mm -hmm. and said, you know what, I'm going to go out and make a living. I'm going to spend my money on what I'm going to spend it on. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to pay attention to the idiots in Washington. Mm -hmm. It seemed like that. Yeah. I love that answer. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. and that's, and that's what they're doing now. Cause I mean, I don't know if you can tell a difference between a Republican and a Democrat anymore, Mm -hmm. but um, I don't, I don't think people, people care. I mean, they're going to, they're going to go to work. They're going to make their money and, they're going to spend it on what they enjoy doing. And that was another thing, COVID. I, th- I think COVID brought new people to the horse world, too, of every discipline, mm-hmm. because they wanted something they could go do Yeah, and get outside. So um, I, don't, I don't know that election years or any of that ever even matters anymore. Mm-hmm. I think it used to, it did, but I, I don't think it does anymore. It seems like people are going to going to live their life the way they're going to live it and not worry about what they're doing well that is a relief to hear you say that (laughs) that is a good quite the relief um now jeremy what's your schedule look like you are uh, you're the busiest man in the horse industry i'm pretty sure but like what this time of year what are you up to and then when does the sale season what are your sales for the year that people need to pay attention to uh right now i'm obviously in the heat of breeding season and and typically we don't have any sales until summertime um, we finished triangle in January and then we have a May sale there, but we are going to do an online sale during the NCHA super stakes this okay. year, just be a small online sale. Um, but our, our main sales, you know, run from October to January and which works out really well because we're so busy with breeding season two, but, um, so it's, it's, it's busy. Yeah, it's a little busy. busy. <laughs> what are you, so on the breeding side of things? Where where do you? I I think I know the answer to this, but like, what does your day to day look like on the breeding side of things? And what are you busiest with? On the phone a lot. On the phone a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on the phone a lot. Um, you know, obviously there's problems in any business, so you you tend to the to the daily problems and try and fix things before it is a big problem. And but spend a lot of time on the telephone. Well, that's, uh, that's brutal. That is absolutely brutal. I I do too, but man, I don't like it. 
uh, you know, I don't, I don't mind it. Some, some days you're like, man, I wish it quit ringing. But then <laughs> my, my, my big saying is if my phone quits ringing, then I'm going to worry. You're right. You're not wrong about that. That's the truth. <laughs> you know, as long as you don't answer that phone, they'll keep calling. You quit answering, they're going to call somebody else that will. So well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to always make sure I answer to call them back anyway. People are going to laugh at you telling me that, that listen to this, because I'm the worst. But I, <laughs> I will, I'll do better. I usually call you back. I'll always text back pretty quickly. Like, hey, I'm on a conference call. Can I call you back later? I'm pretty terrible at, at, having, at being on other calls and never getting a chance to answer the phone. But. Well, that is what I needed, sir. Thank you for carving out some time for me today. Absolutely, anytime. Of course. Well, I sure appreciate you. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you again to our sponsors at Genuine Billy Cook Saddles, the finest handmade saddles and tack at the fairest prices. World famous since 1953, Billy Cook Saddles continue to be built in the USA by horsemen for horsemen. In 2020, Genuine Billy Cook Saddles was revitalized and has been operating under a new business model aimed at producing the highest quality to ensure maximum performance while keeping true to Western horsemanship traditions. That's GenuineBillyCook.com for the finest handmade saddles and tack at the fairest prices. Well, thank you all for listening this far into the score. Uh, now, if you've listened this far and you've made it this far, this is where I give you a promo code if you want to save on the horse training information and all the live streams that we've got on roping.com. You can use the promo code SCORE15 over at roping.com. You'll save 15% on your membership. It's a huge deal. Um, you know, though, if you want more than just a roping.com membership and you're thinking that you're going to be roping a lot this year or you're going to be hauling horses, the key card max is the best deal. You can find that at wstrroping.com, at globalhandicaps.com, or uh, over at the ustrc.com. You can buy that membership. That gets you a roping.com membership, gets you a U.S. Roper membership, and uh, it gets you all kinds of discounts as long as you're meeting the timelines and deadlines uh, over at the World Series in the USTRC. It's the best deal in all of team roping, and that, of course, you can stream all the thousands of hours of roping content we have on roping.com, too. So, you know, two options. Get the key card max. That's my recommendation. It's a smoking deal. $500 for, you know, something that you get a $1,500 value out of, or you can go use score15 at roping.com. Use that at checkout, and you will get your membership to roping.com for the next year if you want. Um, and just binge all the good old stuff that you could possibly want from the wildfires to U.S. finals to the Mobeta calf ropens of the 90s. My personal favorite. The style was very impressive. Lots of brush poppers, lots of starter jackets and caps. It was a blast. So anyway, check it out. <laughs> we'll talk to you guys later. Thank you.